Welcome to the Startup Grind. Over to you guys. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to this wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, as I'm sure most of you have been here before, many of you haven't seen the transformation this place is going through and I'm sure you are awaiting the next month uh, where it will come to completion and we all have Jonathan to thank for that. Before I get into Jonathan it, I think and team. Jonathan and team. When I speak about Jonathan, I speak yeah. about Jonathan and team and what a wonderful team he does have. Jonathan, many of you may not know, and this deserves a cheer and another round of applause, Jonathan is from Durban. Jonathan has come home, he's here to transform our city into a better, better, better place. So a round of applause for Jonathan. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, before we get on to the more formal questions, uh, and uh, Google, uh, or Startup Grind by Google, generally formalizes the way in which we do things, um, I just like to have a little chat about who you are, where you've come from, because I like the story more than anything else. Um, to, 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 to get to where you are today, you must have started somewhere. So obviously I've announced to the crowd that you started off in Durban, you schooled in Durban, can you give us a little bit of a story from there? Yeah, so I went to school at Carmel College, which uh, became Crawford in Glenwood, um, probably what, seven kilometers from here. I actually grew up in Schlanger, which is ironic because now I'm trying to move everybody from Schlanger back to what we call Sumgeni, which is the south of, of the Mgeni River. Um, but I went to school there and I left Durban actually when I was 15 moved to Johannesburg where my father was living, my mom lived in Durban, um, and started a business there, really. Um, my first business was throwing kind of parties inside clubs um, in Rosebank, in Johannesburg. I was a pretty like rebellious young kid. I stopped properly going to school at about 15, so I kind of bumped all the way, but I carried on going technically according to my parents. Um, and uh, I started like training at a really young age, um, a couple of my friends were like into DJing and into the party scene, so I kind of partnered with them and started throwing parties around the city. And then I matriculated at Crawford in, in Sandton, um, and I did a brilliant thing which I really recommend to everybody. I went traveling after that uh, at 18 with my um, three best friends, and we went all around the world and really got a proper understanding of what was going on. Um, in cities everywhere. We went um, to the Middle East, we went to Europe, we went to America, we went to Asia. So we got a good um, understanding of the real, the real world really. I mean, we had, I'd just come out of South Africa in what, 2000 and I think South Africa was a baby then. So it was still learning how to be um, a country and learning how to really create proper cities with, you know, downtowns um, that people wanted to work and live in. So when I came back from um, traveling, I knew that something was missing in South African society. At that stage I was living in Johannesburg um, and I started a couple of businesses, but at that point I really knew that I wanted to be in property. I just wasn't ready for it yet. I think um, the barrier to entry for property is very high in terms of the capital expenditure required. Um, so I started a couple of different businesses. First I went, I think I actually came back to Durban for a while to live. And I was at a shaka one day and I saw like a mobile coffee shop um, called Cafe Pronto. I'm sure you've seen them around the city. And I saw that and I thought that was the best thing I'd ever seen. I just learned about what coffee does for, um, you know, the mind and the energy. And like for me, coffee is like the catalyst for um, that kind of like epiphany, you know, that moment of brilliance. And um, so I became obsessed with coffee, bought this trailer, this mobile coffee trailer, took it to Jobo. Um, and started trying to trade at various like markets and things like that. Um, that didn't work out. All, all my first few businesses all really didn't work out and I'm kind of like very comfortable with um, that level of, of failure. 
which I think is becoming a common theme in Silicon Valley and in America, and what doesn't exist in South Africa, this um, embracing of failure. Uh, so I had my fair share of failures then. Um, after the coffee story, uh, sorry, while I was doing the coffee, I started university. I went to my national university, um, which is an Australian university, but it's got a South African campus in the West Rand in Johannesburg. I chose that because I kind of realized that I couldn't be in environments with lots of, you know, too many people. I'd like kind of gone to smallish schools like Carmel, and I wanted to be at a smaller university, so I went there, I studied accounting. Again, I didn't really actually go to university. I was doing business the whole time, and I just kind of used to go and write my exams. Um, and so the coffee idea failed. I then moved on to, I got a university project um, that said you had to start a business in a couple of different industries. One of them was kind of domestic services. Uh, so I, I'd always had this um, real interest in the kind of maid industry in South Africa, and that I had a very close relationship with my maid growing up, because my mom was working, um, and she was just really awesome. And I always wanted to formalize that industry. I thought that it was quite unusual that it was so informal in this country. And so I started like a proper cleaning service that happened in, in buildings. At this stage I was um, 19. Um, and the idea was to basically provide like a hotel cleaning service, but in apartment buildings. So somebody, a lady would come and clean your house, but like for one hour a day, as opposed to having a full-time maid. Um, and really it was just, again, taking a view that South Africa would be normalizing within kind of international trends, just like, you know, this current business. Um, after about six months of that business, I realized that it was too labor intensive, because I had like, I don't know, 50 odd staff, you know, after six months. Um, and so I said, what can I, you know, in what way can I take advantage of the same fundamentals but have less stops? So I started a chain of laundromats. Um, this was very foreign to me. I mean, I still don't know how to wash my own clothes. Um, you know, like I really had no operational expertise or passion for it, but I kind of seen some sort of gap. So that was called Sorted. Um, and I grew that from like one to 17 stores within, geez, like 18 months was like the fastest growing kind of laundry in Johannesburg and Pretoria. And uh, I really did that until I started the property business, property at about 24 years old. Um, finished university in between while I was doing all of this stuff. Um, but I actually did my first property investment when I was 18. I bought a small apartment with a friend um, whose dad, I think, signed surety to get the bond and we put like 15,000 Rand each in on a like 300,000 Rand deal, renovated it for 30,000 Rand and sold it for like 380,000 Rand. So that's really where I made my first little bit of capital. Um, but I realized then that I really wanted to be in property and it was a matter of time. And actually the guy uh, that um, financed me in the laundry business said the same thing to me. You know, he said that I think you'll learn some school fees on the, the laundry business, but it'll be something else where you actually uh, become a proper success. So you never actually made money um, in those businesses, the coffee no. business? Um... Coffee business, lost money. No. Well, I bought the trailer for 38,000 Rand and I sold it for 40,000 Rand, but I probably had like, you know, operating losses along the way. Uh, the cleaning service definitely lost money. Um, I don't know how much, probably a couple of hundred thousand. And in the laundry business, I probably kind of broke even once I had sold, because I, I then had to once I started the property business, I had to sell all these 17 laundries, which was difficult. I mean, you can't sell it to one person. So one by one, I sold it, and I probably broke even there. So the first business I've actually made money in is this business. What made you keep coming back? I think in South Africa, we often see failure. Uh, an entrepreneur fails. Everyone looks at him dismally. He's embarrassed in front of his friends and his family, and he never comes back. What made you keep coming back? Uh, for me, like, there wasn't really another option. I mean, I, I, I'm not comfortable um, doing anything else. And I've always knew that I would work for myself, and I've got way too great a sense of entitlement. Um, so, <laughs> so, it's, like, it's like just a matter of, I've actually almost never even worked for anyone. I worked for um, one guy in Durban for two months in a property company. I actually learned a hell of a lot uh, there, but I haven't really worked for, for, for anyone. So it's almost just a habit. You know, I started so early. I mean, Warren Buffett, I think, always says that uh, the earlier you start, the better, you know, for entrepreneurship, and I think it's true. I mean, I think they should be teaching entrepreneurship and encourage people to be going on their own from 15, 16. I don't know why anybody would wait till 18.
That is the only solution, really. Yeah. That's the only solution. Tell me, so then you got into the property game, and uh, people thought there's this 24 year old crazy guy buying derelict buildings uh, or building at the beginning in the middle of Joba. What was your vision, and how, I mean, your vision must have been so clear, the clarity must have been there, that you were able to see what is now happening. It's easy well, now to walk in and look at it, but you must have envisioned this a long time ago. No, actually, I think it's, I don't think it works like that really a lot of the time. I think that the way that people overplay this ability to have this vision is sometimes a little bit overstated, you know? And in my case, I mean, actually what happened is that, so I did that first property, um, and then I, did another property which was like a conversion of an old factory space into, in, into a, a living and working space and that made me understand that hey there's a bit of potential of taking industrial spaces like this and becoming new things um, but it was completely opportunistic initially I mean I just found one deal I knew I wanted to do a building it was really about scale I knew that I wanted to be um, in that kind of like artistic conversion kind of space I knew that I wanted to be participating in urban regeneration and being part of the city, so that kind of drove the location. The rest of it, though, was completely opportunistic. I mean, right price, right time, you know, right place, go. Didn't think about it that much. And was this innovation at its best, or had you seen this model working uh, internationally as you had no. traveled, or was it research-driven, or was it simple, just the simple numbers, I'll buy it for X amount, I'll renovate it for X amount, and I'll let it out for X amount. It was very much just like a gut feeling. Basically, the way that I've built the whole property business and the way that we still build it today is based on complete selfish needs. So I call it enlightened self-interest. But basically, you say to yourself, what would you need for this city or this space, and just build it. So at that time, I was like, I would love to be part of a creative community. I'm not really part of one now. Or well, the one that I'm kind of part of, because I was part of that converted factory space, wasn't done properly. Let me do it properly. Um, I want to live there potentially too. I want to live and work in the same space. I, 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 then do for everybody else. And when did the traction really come in? When did the, the rubber hit the road and, 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 and this starting to become much bigger than the one? Well, what happened early on, so my first building in my brain was called, what is called Arts on Main, uh, which is a collection of arts, studios, galleries, creative office spaces, about four and a half thousand square meters. Which was like big early on. I mean, I was 24, it was a couple, you know, it was probably a 15, 20 million rand developments. Um, but what happened there in terms of traction is that quite early on we got William Kentridge on board. Um, William Kentridge is by far, I think, his most um, prominent visual artist. And on some level, I guess he was like an anchor and definitely helped with the traction. But then I guess I started leveraging off a network. Uh, within within the kind of broader Johannesburg creative community, I had people around me, close people that were in that community, and I I think what I did best is that I leveraged off that. Did you ever think you were wrong? You were going down the wrong path in this in this urban regeneration. You were there. You were in a, build, a building that was amongst derelict and empty buildings that you were now redeveloping. Did you ever question yourself? Did you did you back yourself the whole way? I think I probably question myself about five times a day. Um, at least, so definitely. I mean, I've got confidence, but you know, I think as an entrepreneur, you just you kind of riding a bit of a roller coaster. Um, and just when you think that you understand your business model perfectly, something comes unexpected, and you have to re-engineer it. But I think that's what the failure probably taught you is that there will be something after the mess. If the mess does happen, there is something after that, and I'm backing myself rather than the business. Absolutely. Look, I think you just you've got to pick a. A route and you've got to send it hard. You know, so you've really got to. You've, it's fine to have those like moments of uncertainty, but broadly, you've got to come back to that confidence space. You've got a room full of entrepreneurs here. What kind of advice? How many people are entrepreneurs? Yeah, let's, let, let's, let's get a sense here. How many people? Can we stand up? Can we stand up, entrepreneurs? Can we stand up? I think Jonathan and I need to give you a round of applause. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well done, guys. Somebody can take a view that they want to be part of a very entrepreneurial company. 
There's a lot to be said about that as well, you know. I mean, Johnny Ives from Apple isn't an entrepreneur, but he hasn't had a terrible career, has he? Correct. <laughs> I mean, that, that comes to another um, nice term called intrapreneurship. Um, what do you think about that? So the ability to think like an entrepreneur, innovate like an entrepreneur, back yourself like an entrepreneur, but within an organization. What's your thoughts on that? I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of it. Um, I mean, some of, some of them are sitting in the crowd on opportunity. Um, and, you know, I just believe in the principle of initiative. So I like to kind of delegate, let go, and let people really become entrepreneurs within that broader entrepreneurial environment. And how do you inculcate that culture and imbibe that culture in your organization? Talk to me a little about that. I think it's about being bold, um, you know, an intrepid attitude where, um, you know, failure isn't the end of the world. And, and people feel like they're a proper, proper part of the team. And that it's not about me as the head of the company, but it's about proper charity as a, as a team. And how do you measure your success? Um, I know it's definitely uh, not in monetary terms. How do you measure your success and your rate of success as you as you move through the years? Look, I think money or commercial is definitely not uh, you know out of my mind. I mean, it's there. It's important. That's what keeps it sustainable. Um, but I think you know we mainly measure it in terms of impact. Um, so we're in you know we're in the business of disrupting um, African cities really. And so if we can change the way that people engage with Johannesburg, Durban, Pretoria, we're looking at other African cities, that's, that's really the gate of our success. When you're a market leader, and I do consider you a market leader, I know you have utter humility, but when you're a market leader and you've, and, and, and you've led the inner city regeneration in now South Africa, um, it becomes harder and harder to innovate as you get more and more successful. So you have almost a responsibility at the top. Like Apple may have a responsibility to deliver a better iPhone 7 than they have an iPhone 6, um, or Samsung for that matter. You have a responsibility. How do you view that? Well, I think the big thing in uh, urban regeneration is that it needs critical mass. And it's one of the best examples where the sum is greater than the parts. So I think the leadership, uh, you know, being in the leadership position, you have to encourage some level of competition um, and really almost partner with other companies and take a view on the city. So I don't think one company can redevelop the whole of Durban CBD or the whole of Joburg CBD. So it's taking a kind of like anti-commercial route um, on some level and encouraging others in. For example, we've just announced a partnership with Delta Property Fund. We've got I think a 4 billion rand uh, portfolio in the city. Some people would have seen then with some level of threat, we saw it as a great opportunity. Um, it's, it's interesting, Jonathan and I had a discussion about that a couple of days ago, and my question to him was, why partner with Propertuity? Um, surely you could, in inverted commas, copy Propertuity and what they've done in the city. And Jonathan had something interesting, and I'd like you to share it with the crowd. He says it's all about energy. It's about the energy that you bring to that and the, and, 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 and the deep, uh, learnings that you have, it looks... Well, I think, yeah, I think there's two things. I mean, first of all, I think people partner with us not because of money, because we don't have, you know, the same amounts of financial capital as a company like Delta, which is a 10 billion rand fund. People partner with us for intellectual capital. That's really our greatest asset. And, but it's funny you mentioned this thing about copying. Some guy came up to me <laughs> before this talk and said he owns the building across the road and you know he wants to do something that all he actually thought about doing was just copying us. Well I mean I think that's a bad strategy. I mean to copy is really to not innovate and to not innovate is to not grow. We need growth. Tell me, you've done a fantastic job in Joburg and we're proud of you and we welcome you back with open arms to Durban. What are your plans for Durban and what do you hope to create in Durban? So I think firstly what was quite interesting for me, and I think they must be given some credit for it, is that the city of Durban actually approached me um, about two and a half years ago. At that point, um, there was a kind of uh, mayoral committee, or there was actually a lady called Dr. Moyo who was set up to focus on urban regeneration. Um, she was a deputy city manager. And she came with a whole entourage to Mabuneng and I took them on a tour, and she said, listen, I really want you to come to Durban. At that point, I wasn't ready for it. 
but she definitely was one of the first people to plant the seed for me. I mean, I always thought that if I was going to go to the next city, it would be here, because it's familiar to me. Um, but kind of did start the city, and I think it's important to give the city some credit. Um, you know, the Durban city management, if you have to compare it to Johannesburg, you know, people complain about government in Durban. Come to Joburg and you'll see. Um, it's a different story altogether. So Durban's got a you know, closer community and there's more interaction between city and, and the private sector. And I know that you're part of the Chamber of Commerce and we're going to start um, participating hopefully with that. There's the URP that's been set up in the city which is a, a private body but that's supported by the government to try and bring back the city. So I think public-private partnerships are an extremely important um, strategy in bringing the city back. I mean, it's interesting you say that. So if you walk through Maboning, there's a lot that you've done almost selflessly in the common areas. Um, something that should have been the responsibility of the municipality or the city. Mm. Um, how did you view that? I mean, were there hard yeah. decisions to make when you had to do those things that you actually didn't need to do? Yeah, I mean, the city of Johannesburg as a specific body hasn't um, contributed at all to us. The, there is an agency called the Johannesburg Development Agency which I must give some credit to in that we've done two public-private partnerships with them. I'm not saying it's um, seamless, even with all of them, but they've contributed a little bit. For the most part, 95%, 99% of the investment that's gone into Mabaling has been all property. Excellent, excellent stuff. Tell me a little bit about the decision-making process and how do you make your decisions. You were telling me an interesting uh, story the other day about how you order a building in 45 minutes. Um, within 45 that minutes. That was uh, too impulsive. It was too impulsive. <laughs> <laughs> but that means... So I've got two, I think I've got two ways of making decisions. One is extremely impulsive, and one is, you know, properly considered. And um, I think there's different times for, for each. Uh, I guess a balance in between would be great, and I think as I'm mature, as a business person, I'll probably find that balance. Um, but sometimes you need to make quick calls. I mean, that property, as an example, was about to go on auction the next day. So it wasn't like I just did it um, with no urgency in the background. Um, but it probably would have been better if I'd held back. Actually, the next week I set up an investment committee. So, <laughs> so that was my response to that crazy... But generally, I mean, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs in terms of their decision-making process? Is, is, is back yourself number one in regard to that? I think it depends which stage you are in your business. You know, in the first, in the formative years, you can go more on gut, and then as the business starts to evolve, you need to start consulting with others more, etc. Eric, our MD in Durban, actually sent me a, a new Steve Jobs book, which deals with that. It's kind of like deals with his evolution from being a like single-minded leader to you know, being a delegating proper leader that gets other people to consult with him when he makes big strategic calls. So I think it's mainly stage of, of, of your business. And, and, and how did you make that transition? So, from the outside and, and chatting to you, you, you seem to have made that transition well. A lot of entrepreneurs don't make that transition. So, they they artisans or they mm -hmm. tradesmen, um, and they always want to be tradesmen. Yeah. So, I think that actually brings up quite an interesting um, debate around what an entrepreneur is. Mm, you know, I'm not so sure if somebody, an artisan, is an entrepreneur. You know, an entrepreneur is, probably should be defined by somebody that employs a fair amount of people, um, that is enterprising and really grows it to a certain level. So I think some people actually should stop at being an artisan, being a sole trader or an independent. Not everybody has to become a mogul, I'm not saying I'm one, but you know, hopefully I'll become one one day. So it's, it's a different approach, um, you know, depending on your growth appetite and your ambition. How easy is it to let go? So obviously you did a lot at the beginning, now you've got a nice team around you that does a lot. How easy is it to delegate and let go? Because a lot of entrepreneurs like to say, I need a team around me and I'd like to delegate to them, but they actually keep a lot close to their chest. Yeah, so I think you get two different types of leaders. You get, well, not really leaders, you get two different types of entrepreneurs. You get the ones that surround themselves with weak people, and you get the ones that surround themselves with strong people and are comfortable with, with, with delegating. And I definitely like to think of myself um, in that second category. And I think once you develop that great skill of human resources, strategic human resourcing, 
and you make sure that you've got the right type of people around you that can challenge you and compliment you, um, then I think that it starts becoming very easy to let go. I mean, if I look at this Durban business as an example, um, I come to Durban every second week from Wednesday to Sunday, so I'm here a third of the time effectively. And the team's running it, you know, probably as well, if not better, than, than, than Johannesburg. Tell us a little bit about your, your Durban properties and your view and your vision for them. So obviously you've done a, a residential conversion in, in, in West Street, sold out, I think, in a, in, in, in a matter of days, uh, or weeks. Yeah. Um, so this was our first building. Um, this we bought in about July last year, and we were in quite a big rush to open. This is kind of an unusual property for us in that it's very small. It's only 800 square meters before we added the and there's new levels. And the thinking behind this building was to introduce a, you know, a weekly market and to have almost see this as like a little bit of a catalyst or a gateway into what we were going to do um, down the road. And that's what we did. We opened the building with a weekly market, I think on August 3rd last year with the UI, you know, the architecture conference. So we strategically wanted to open during that important design event. We see the company really as a design company. So we wanted to align it with that event. So I think that that worked out well strategically. The market and everything went well. And then we started to, to, to think about letting this development evolve into a proper creative artisanal community. And so that's what we've done. I think we've got 54 pods, um, 27 on the bottom, 27 on the top. Space is going from like 2,500 to 3,500 rand and kind of retail ground floor, small office spaces, first floor. It's gone very well. I think most of the retail spaces are taken as some office spaces left. We expect them to be gone as soon as we complete it. You can see we're just finishing the pods and we'll finish this in like a month. Our next development was Pixie House, and that was our first really big proper development um, in Durban, and it's residential, so 125 apartments. It did sell um, very well. I think it sold out maybe in like two months or um, of course, you always have units coming back into the market if somebody doesn't get a bond, that kind of thing. Um, but it's gone very well. We, you know, people have received it amazingly. We had this uh, opening um, about two months ago that was just like the most uh, important moment in the regeneration of Durban CBD where we really started seeing people come back to that part of the city. You know, I think this area, which is being called Rivertown, and that area, northeast of us, or south, southwest of us actually, uh, which is Durban Central, like two completely different things. So we're looking to develop two different nodes, with this being the first there, Pixley House being the first in that node, but now we've gone and bought a number of buildings um, in Durban Central as well. So we've taken quite a big view on um, Pixley Casana Street, which is the old West Street, and Anton Mbede, which is the old um, Smith Street. So we I'm not going to disclose all the building names because they're kind of like under negotiation on some level, but I would say we've got eight big buildings in Durban Central confirmed. So I think we've almost already achieved the level of critical mass in terms of our acquisitions. So there's big, big things coming to Durban CBD. Then there's the Delta partnership, which just takes it to another level. Excellent. And, you know, what was interesting... Um when, when, when I looked at Mamuning and I looked at I, I, I look at this uh, I mean this property is essentially you've created or nurtured or informally incubated kind of 27 businesses here. Um, am I right in the number? 34. 17, 17. Well, my what do you mean 54. Mean? It's 54 because yeah. we are. Some, some of them would have started before this, therefore they might need some incubation, and some of them might be started within this. But say 50. Yeah. But I mean. You said something interesting the other day to me is build it properly and the people will come. Yeah. And I think this building and your past buildings are testament to that. Um, I mean, you've literally brought people into the inner city. You've created businesses there for the entrepreneurs that, 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 that run them today. And you fill them with people. So you've essentially handed a lot of it on a plate to the entrepreneurs who, who, who run those businesses created your own community. Yeah. Talk to us a little about that and your strategy around that because essentially the market here was to activate the space and get the energy right in the space. Talk to me a little more Look, about that. I think it's like a collaborative, symbiotic kind of relationship that exists between us and those independent 
um, tenants, both in Mabaneng and and in Durban. I mean, most landlords, you know, want to sign big blue chip leases with corporates because the banks give you proper financing on the back of those leases. So we've basically pioneered a new business model that focuses on independence. You almost don't speak to big commercials unless they're in certain spaces. So to give you an idea, uh, we've got a Galitos opening on the south side of one of our buildings um, in Durban Central called Pioneer Place. I don't know if it's uh, next door 320, which is another of our buildings. Um, but we've taken a view that anything onto the main streets, we're happy to speak to the corporates in because that's the nature of our streets all over the world. But then as soon as we go into the smaller lanes, we're looking to curate that with independence. And in Mabuling, we've taken the same view. So we strategically look to put the independence together where they make sense, uh, possibly in like lower uh, mass for traffic and more destination orientated, and then look to bring the corporates in on the more mass side. But really what we're trying to do is to find that perfect intersection between big business and small business. I don't think you can exclude either. And how flexible are you in that vision? That vision will change over time as you, as you saw a property or bought a property or redeveloped a property. There's nothing set in stone, I, I, I would understand. Yeah, look, I think for the most part we're looking to develop kind of niche, well-curated spaces for independent businesses. But as I said, you know, we have to talk to both. To give you an example, at 320, which is our biggest building, up, you know, I'm sure most people know 320 West, we've rebranded with 320 Pixley. Um, it's a 30-story tower um, in the middle of Durban Central. There we've got, I think, one of the tenants, like a cell C call center, as an example. And they've got like the whole floor, super commercial. And then underneath that, we'll have lots of small businesses together. Excellent, excellent stuff. Tell me a little bit about, you've talked about it informally earlier on, but the ecosystems that you create, how do you curate and grow and nurture these ecosystems? So look, it's, um, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, the amount of energy that we have to put into you know, our, our business compared to a typical property business where they're again just signing breach of leases, it's exponentially more, um, you know, more effort. But I think you've got to take a bit of a patient view. Um, and you've got to work with the tenants to help promote them. I mean, in, in Mabaneng as an example, we've got, I think, 57,000 Facebook fans, which in South Africa is a big number. Um, and through that channel and through our newsletter, which goes out to a big database, and through a lot of publicity, we promote the neighborhood and we promote tenants. So we almost take, on some level, a bit of a centralized marketing approach to the neighborhood and the individual tenants benefit of that and an eco ecosystem is developed around that. Excellent. We've got entrepreneurs in the room, we've got really entrepreneurs, we've got intrapreneurs in the room. What are three kind of gems of advice with your experience that you could give to them, John? So I think touching on what I spoke about um, earlier, surrounding yourself with, with, with the right people I think is, is, is super key and actually taking a bit of a view that you might have like a higher kind of overhead cost initially, um, you know, but that can be the foundation for, for growth going forward. Um, then, I think what I always say, and you can hear about the failures um, in my past, is you've got to find something that you're properly, properly passionate about. I mean, yes, I was passionate about coffee, but I didn't see myself, you know, earning 40 coffee traders around the country. Uh, yes, I saw that there was a, a gap in the market for a cleaning service and a laundry, but I still don't know how to iron my own shirts. So I think with you know with property, I really found something that you know makes me lift, it makes me um, excited. So that was that I think is is, is the single most important thing. Um, and then I would say cash flow management, which is you know something that a lot of people know, but um, is, is is so important. I mean, we've had. You know, lots of ups and downs. Property can be very intensive um, on cash flow. You can be waiting from, you know, for money from the banks, etc. But managing cash flow with proper projections and having accountants like yourself on board, I think very early on, um, I think finance is the backbone of a business. Excellent. Um, with that, uh, we're going to open up to the floor for, for questions. Um, so, any questions for, for, for Jonathan from the floor? Please don't be shy. We've got one at the back. Um, we have a mobile mic by any chance? No, we don't. You just have to speak quite loudly, please, sir.
I think it's a great question. It's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. It's a difficult one in a private business. I think it's something that becomes much easier when you get big enough to list. Um, but having said that, most of our staff are on some type of incentive. So I think incentives is a step towards some sort of equity uh, program. So almost every person in the business is on some level of incentive, whether it at a minimum be some sort of bonus scheme, but many of the key staff are um, kind of have payment schemes linked to performance of the business and it's, it happens quite regularly through the year. Um, so often linked to projects, I think that's, that's one way of doing it in our business um, quite easily. But I think over time, I mean this business has only been going for eight years. Over time I think we're going to have to have to look at um, equity. You know, there's lots of ways of structuring equity as well. Employees can buy equity in. Um, but again, the best way to do that is to, to start thinking bigger picture this thing. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions? There must be some burning questions in the audience. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I think, look, I mean, um, finding the ideal finance partner at 21, I was pretty lucky. Um, so, all I can say is that I think that that can be trans transformative for, for your business model. And I would hugely, hugely suggest that to anybody. I mean, um, access to capital just takes you to the next level. And I was pretty fortunate to start knocking on doors early on, but I kind of knew who I wanted to partner with um, and I've been very fortunate that the same company has really backed me from 21 years old, so I've been with them for 11 years now, they've stuck through thick and thin and it's been a very, very um, good partnership for both. What's interesting about that, I think um, Jonathan is something you mentioned to me is he, he told you or the company told you up front that you were never going to make money in the laundries but uh, the company backed you as an individual yeah. right, and had confidence that you would make money one day. How important are jockeys in businesses? I think jockeys are everything. I mean, you know, they're the leaders in the business and um, I think the finance partner also plays a key role so it's about finding the right kind of jockey with a certain level of ambition and matching that person with a finance partner that has a similar level of ambition, hopefully the same kind of like growth horizons, those kind of things. You've got to really, you know, it's really a long term relationship, so you've got to make sure that you're fully compatible. You obviously understand risk a lot more today than you did in your uh, late teens or, or early 20s. Did you understand what risk meant at that point in time? Not, no, not properly. I mean, I still think I'm like an amateur when it comes to risk. I think it's probably one of my weak points. I think I like to uh, focus more on the opportunity and the upside. But again, that's been something that having the right people around me, especially my partners and the people around my partners, where their main role in the business is to really identify properly the risk. Um, you know, they don't often come to me with opportunities. It's me talking about opportunities and then talking about risk, and that can also work. That's true. Uh, we've got a question there. What is your hurdle rate? That is the minimum, yeah, the minimum return on investment that you expect on your initial capital expenditure, if you have one at all. I suspect it's related to risk, but you have a minimum return of, expect of invest, return on investment. So it depends on a couple of things. It depends on asset class, so whether it's retail, residential, industrial, um, or office space. Um, and it depends on whether we're selling the asset. So sometimes we develop and sell, or whether we are holding the asset. But I wouldn't say we have like set minimums. If I had to really give a number on a hold, I would say somewhere between 12 and 13 percent yields, depending on the cost of capital on the deal, so what, you know, what cost of gearing you're getting on the deal. Um, and then if we're selling, I would say kind of minimum net profit percentage of around 18 to 20%. We've got a question here. Uh, 
got two uh, just user and then in the back after that. A quick question around uh, inner city rejuvenation and prop being a property developer. How do you deal with issues around gentrification and all those issues? <laughs> you must be a journalist. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> how do you handle that? You're from the Melling Guardian. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> No, I laugh at this gentrification thing because it's really not relevant yet in Johannesburg and Durban. I think it's starting to become relevant in Cape Town. But gentrification really is um, a situation with it, which exists in, in, in many developed uh, cities like London and New York um, where there's a shortage of affordable accommodation, whether it be residential or, or working space, um, often pushing out uh, people with lesser budgets like artists, etc. Um, in Johannesburg and Durban, what you've actually got is an oversupply of affordable accommodation in your cities. Most of the buildings are empty. Um, so that drives all the prices down. In Cape Town, what you're starting to see is that because it's got a small um, CBD, the affordable accommodation is being squeezed out, and that's really a gentrification. It might become relevant here um, in the next decade. But right now, if anything, I would say we need some sort of level of reverse gentrification. You know, you can't have cities that only have low income populations. You need low with middle with high, and then what happens is that opportunities start, you know, happening between these income groups. So it starts bridging these huge gaps of income that exist within our society. At the back, we had a question. Yes. Optimistic. I think that's the, the key and um, 